टीचर डॉक्टर शिवाजी बासु एंड डॉक्टर एस के पाल आई डोंट नो वेदर ही विल जॉइन और नॉट ही इज आल्सो बीइंग इनवाइटेड फॉर द टू डेज क्लास एंड विद अस वी आर सपोज्ड टू हैव डॉक्टर नितेश कुमार फ्रॉम पटना डॉक्टर संदीप गुप्ता फ्रॉम कलकत्ता डॉक्टर राहुल गुप्ता फ्रॉम जम्मू एंड डॉक्टर समरेंद्र पावनम फ्रॉम इंफॉल सो आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू सर फॉर टू डेज क्लास एंड वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग मिक्सचर ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस एंड द यूथ Uh, will help our students to make them prepare for their forthcoming examination with this small introduction and i am handing over to our um, uh, president respected president dr ranbir prasad singh to conduct the show good evening everyone my job was made very easier by Ran professor ranjan de i welcome the expert moderator and my senior dr shivaji basu our colleagues and students this topic is really the bread and butter for the urologists most of the few are practicing solely the stone bili and most of them are like the part of it starting from the evaluation where metabolic work up is needed how the puncture is done what are the complications you encounter how to come out of it that is the most important and everything will be discussed straight where i hope and believe that it will be a very fruitful session for most of the students undergoing this clearing their mch exam so without wasting the time hand over i hand over mic to moderator dr harpreet singh and to go ahead sir thank you ranveer sir for your kind words uh, good evening ranveer sir uh, ranjan sir shivaji da and all the my co panelists and co speakers as well as the students who have joined uh, so we'll we'll start right at then i must congratulate uh, east zone council uh, for running very successfully uh, this program from last two months is going on every saturday sunday it's very engaging and it's very Uh, knowledge based and learning i appreciate all the teachers who have put their efforts into it to make this uh, such a uh, successful program and uh, the participation enthusiasm itself tell us volume about this with this uh, uh, with this brief i will uh, start without any uh, before i start i will uh, i will ask uh, if shivaji da wants to make any comment before we start shivaji over to shivaji da no thank you harpreet you go ahead but i just want to make sure that all uh, the students are here today we can we apart from sanu i can't find the names of the other ones if they please, can please identify please wait three minutes please I'll wait three uh, minutes to join the lecture attendance sanu patidar i can see arif yes. islam arif can you can you yes. on your video please arif islam can you can yes. you dr vibhav kant badaria yes sir okay arif islam sir राहुल Yes, my uh, my Maybe in on. between in between there is emergency or oh, clot retention. I have to go in between, but I am I am I am there. Okay, good, good, good. Clot retention due to PCNL or something else? No, no, sir. There is a traumatic catheterization, and he is on an antiplatelet. Okay, 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 good, good. Uh, uh, so uh, I will uh, without you. Yeah, I will invite uh, Sandeep there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
ए संदीप वीडियो कॉल करो सो आई विल रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर संदीप टू स्टार्ट द मेटाबॉलिक इवैल्यूएशन इन स्टोन डिजीज राइट अवे संदीप बिकॉज़ आई एम इनविजिबल सर या एब्सोल्युटली सर आई विल स्टार्ट दिस ओके राहुल इज ज्वाइन सर सुमरेंद्र पोनम विल नॉट बी एबल टू ज्वाइन फ्रॉम मणिपुर बिकॉज़ ऑफ द इंटरनेट इश्यूज सो ही विल नॉट बी he will not be joining sir he is i know i know this i know this rahul has joined and uh, partha pratim will not join so uh, nitish will present his presentation i i have prepared for rahul but since rahul has joined so i'm very happy that i'm spared of that uh, sandeep you can start yes sir so we'll first go about the metabolic evolution of stone disease so uh, the prevalence of urinary stone is increasing rapidly and gender prevalence earlier male female was the uh, male was more common than females but recent studies have shown females are having a higher prevalence of stone disease so it becomes very important to meta uh, evaluate the uh, stone formers so that the recurrence chances is uh, less so we'll just go about briefly about the meta metabolic evaluation so the metabolic evaluation should be simple to perform economically viable and it should provide information that can be made useful and applied so whether to do it in pardon sir your slides are not moving no now abhi aaya sir it is visible you can can you do speak it full full screen and it's full screen sir it's full screen sir from my side okay uh, are you able to see sir full screen no. yeah it's no it's not, not full screen it made in the presentation mode but i made it full screen sir just now actually but it's not coming any okay okay anyway still readable so you can go so what we seeing is first time stone formers is that is yes sir yes sir that's the first that's the slide we will now now okay so far so, okay yes sir so uh, like can we involve the residents sir in this talk or only i should be speaking i think you finish up the first then we have a question and answer session with them so we'll we'll involve them okay sir okay sir so some suggest that first time stone formers should be provided empirical fluid yes sir Uh, i see a lot of slides is to <laughs> no i'll just skip sir i'll just skip yeah yeah so we have some time to yes sir yes sir definitely in 10 minutes i'll finish off mm -hmm. so whether first uh, time stone formers should be evaluated metabolically or not this is a topic of debate so basically the high risk stone formers are patients identified who have a family history of stone disease obesity metabolic syndrome primary hyperparathyroidism sarcoidosis type 2 diabetes uti is recurrent so the basic and absolute indications for metabolic evaluation they are recurrent stone formers those having a small a strong family history of stones having osteoporosis history of uti with calculi solitary kidneys anatomic abnormalities renal insufficiency and stones composed of cysteine uric acid and stuvite so these are the absolute indications where metabolic evaluation should be done so we have this abbreviated protocol for stone formers so a history blood investigations especially sodium potassium calcium uric acid ipth bun creatinine urine the ph of the urine very important urine culture if there's a urea spreading organism so infection lithiasis just slides are still not moving slides are not moving sandeep okay sir i'll just try uh, i'll i'll just do it uh, in this mode now, now it has moved now it has yes, moved so for recurrent stone formers aua defines recurrent stone formers are patient with recurrent stone episodes and multiple stones at initial presentation AU guidelines on the medical management of renal stone recommend that clinicians perform additional metabolic testing in high risk or interested first time stone formers and recurrent stone formers 24 hour urinary collection the important things that you need to check is the total urinary creatinine 
urinary calcium how to collect the 24 hour urinary creatinine that is also very important patient is instructed to discontinue any medication known to interfere with the metabolism of calcium uric acid or oxalate two random 24 hour urinary samples are collected these 24 hour specimens are obtained with the patient on a random diet normal lab values for urinary parameters stone analysis again very important it may be more practical to obtain than a 24 hour urinary collection and it is a good adjunct to serum and urine metabolic evaluation aua guideline recommends stone analysis at least once when it is available to help classify patients and guide preventive measures then X-ray diffraction and micro CT. These are two techniques, but X-ray diffraction is the main technique by which we are doing the stone analysis. This is a micro CT appearance of a 7 mm stone removed from the kidney. What are the general preventive measures? Fluid intake, at least 2.5 to, uh, 2 to 3 liters per day. Neutral pH beverages. Nutritional advice should be a balanced diet, rich in vegetables and fiber. Normal calcium content, 1 to 1.2 gram per day, limited sodium content, and limited animal protein content. Then BMI, adequate physical activity, balancing of excessive fluid loss. These are other ways. Then we have the various composition of stones, calcium-based calculi. They're the most common, around 80%. Brushite stones are a subtype of calcium phosphate. It is important that if brushite material is identified, then they are hard stones and resistant to EHWA. Role of dietary calcium evidence supports the maintenance of moderate calcium intake. Calcium restriction leads to intestinal resorption of oxalates and oxalate stones. So calcium supplementation is also advocated in some cases. Then hypercalcuria will skip all this because these are very much in details. Then sarcoidosis and granulomatous disease, uh, they also need to be uh, treated, accomplished by glucocorticoids, which decrease the granulomatous activity and ultimately the hypercalcemia that results from it. Dietary sodium increases urinary calcium level because sodium and calcium share a common transport mechanism in the renal tube. Recommended target for patients with calcium stones is sodium consumption of less than or equal to 100 milli equivalents per day. We have certain medical therapies for hypercalciuria like hydrochlorothiazide, potassium supplementation, chlorothalidone. These are some medications. Then we have hypocitraturia. Citrate is the most commonly recognized inhibitor of calcium oxalate stone formation. And some of the causes include distal RTA, chronic diarrhea, physical exercise, that is lack of it, and depletion of potassium. Treatment is alkalinization therapy with potassium citrate. It is sufficient to treat hypocitraturia, which is an important and often overlooked cause of recurrent stone episodes. Then hyperuricosuria, excess uric acid in the urine, and it is due to endogenous causes or exogenous factors. Hallmark of uric acid stone formation is the low urinary pH. Treatment of these stones is dietary modification and medical therapy. Cornerstone of this management is alkalinization of the urine, potassium citrate, or we can even give allopurinol. Side effects include stomachache, diarrhea, and drowsiness. Then hyperoxaluria. Oxalate is a ubiquitous molecule, molecule that originates from both diet and a byproduct of metabolism. Oxalobacter formigens, deficiency of this is one of the reasons for calcium oxalate calculate. Then we have enteric hyperoxaluria, which is due to GI malabsorption and diarrhea. Conservative strategies include restricted oxalate diet, hyperoxaluria, mainly due to black tea, spinach, and such other uh, dietary substitutes. Medical therapy includes calcium supplementation. Magnesium also acts as a binder of oxalate and it destabilizes the calcium oxalate crystal formation. Adequate hydration and potassium citrate. 
we can also give pyridoxine that is vitamin b6 then hypomagnesuria magnesium is a known inhibitor of stone formation as it competes with calcium for binding oxalate and other ions to form soluble complexes to prevent stone formation and the treatment of hypomagnesuria is consumption of magnesium rich fruits like bananas and soya beans or increased magnesium in the form of medicines side effects include stomach upset and diarrhea then cystinuria cystinuria is an autosomal, autosomal recessive disorder due to slc3a1 or slc7a9 gene and cystin represents 1% of stone all stone formation uh, formation the mainstay of treatment is surgical intervention and to reduce the urinary concentration of cystin to below its soluble limit there is good evidence that excess dietary sodium can lead to increase in cystin excretion therefore restriction of dietary sodium should be used in management of cystin patients then deep penicillamine converts stone forming cystin into soluble cystin thiocronin that is thiola it can also be given captopril is another medicine which is used to treat cystin then we have infection stones stones that form secondary to infection of the urine with ureas producing bacteria these calculi form in the presence of alkaline urine and in an environment rich in ammonia they represent 10 to 15% of all stones and they can be quite large and take on a typical staghorn or partial staghorn formation cornerstone is surgical treatment medical management of infection calculi centers on the prevention of recurrence rather than medical dissolution so this is the protocol which one can follow for uh, metabolic evaluation of stone disease general stone expulsive therapies we all know medical expulsion therapy so just to conclude some dietary and nutritional aspects of stone prevention and treatment are generalizable to any patient that is copious water intake controlling dietary sodium avoiding excess protein and eating enough calcium and these interventions have been demonstrated patients thank you now i think we can go for our discussion thank you sandeep yes sir uh, i can can you stop sharing yes sir so yes. we'll keep the discussion at the end sandeep we'll move okay, on sir. so we we'll finish okay, all sir. the four presentations and then we will 20 minutes we have been given for that discussion stop for the point of time stop sharing where it is stop share okay sir i think i'm out right so i will share my screen Can you see my screen? Yes. You can hear me well. Absolutely. Okay. So we start. So I will be talking erythritis pregnancy. I'll finish in next ten minutes. I'll just give you a brief glimpse at the end, and the way the Sandeep presented the flow chart, I'll give you a flow chart which will be very easy to follow. So without any wasting time, incidence incidence of renal stone in pregnancy is one in fifteen hundred, similar to non-pregnant women. uh physiological hydronephrosis occurs in 90% of pregnant women diagnosis of urolithesis in gravid uterus with suspected renal colic is complex hydronephrosis hydronephrosis make it difficult to rely on traditional signs and symptoms for diagnosis diagnostic imaging only be better after consideration of risk and benefits accurate diagnosis is paramount to guide the appropriate man management ideal techniques of management must consider maximizes diagnostic yield minimizes harm to fetus and mother 
by contrast methods or ionizing radiation, pain management, need for anesthesia, possibility of obstetric complications, many threats, main threats are preterm labor with delivery, which can occur in up to 50% of women and premature rupture of membranes, which are the two concerns. And urinothesis in a gravid patient requires a multidisciplinary team approach. So complications which can occur, occur, uh, uh, occur in pregnancy is obstructive uropathy, hypertension, higher, uh, higher incidence of CS section, gestational diabetes mellitus, recurrent abortion, and preeclampsia. So physiological hydronephrosis in pregnancy, right side it is more 90%, left side 67%. Causes are progesterone and mechanical effect of gravid uterus. Why right side? Because right ureter at pelvic brain and dextro rotation of uterus. Left ureter. <laughs> left ureter. <laughs> left ureter. <laughs> left ureter <laughs> is the Can you hear me? Or the link is gone. It's an external noise. It's an external noise. So, left ureter is more proximal, lateral, and is protected by sigmoid colon. And the post postpartum resolution of hydronephrosis up to six weeks, it resolved completely. So, though pregnancy is a lithogenic condition with hydronephrosis, stagnation of urine, still the incidence of urinothesis is same in pregnant or non-pregnant. Why? So, to answer that, what are the metabolic changes in pregnancy? Hypercalciuria is one of the changes which occurs in second and third trimester, is highest in second and third trimester. Increased GFR, increased sodium excretion, calcium and uric acid excretion is more. Placental ex excretion of 125 dihydroxycalciferol and oxalate excretion is not increased except postpartum. This is very important. And what are the type of stones in the pregnancy? It is calcium phosphate. Generally, urine is pH is alkaline. We see more of calcium oxalate, but here it is phosphate for P for pregnancy, P for phosphate. This is for postgraduates to remember it. And there is a similarly increase in excretion of inhibitors like citrate, magnesium, glycosaminoglycans, and gestational hypersulfateria. This is the reason you don't see uh, much stone formation despite being so much uh, increased lithogenic conditions. Pain is the commonest symptoms of almost 96 percent. 30 percent are uh, uh, of the urinary colics are misdiagnosed. This is quite a uh, significant number. Presentation is mainly second or third trimester. Renal pelvis is the most common site for stone formation. More common in multigravida. It's mainly OPD treatment responded to painkillers, tramadol, paracetamol, and maybe sometimes asymptomatic. Uh, but yes, some people do require indoor treatment also. So ultrasound is easily available, is the first line of treatment, not having any ionizing radiation exposure, safe to mother and fetus. You can see the PCS, renal parenchyma very well, dilatation, and occasionally the calculus itself. It may diagnose alternative pathology also, like bowel obstruction, appendicitis, placental abrasion, so on. So what we want to see that ultrasonography is safe, you, uh, normally, sensitivity is 34% and 86% specificity, but transvaginal ultrasound, renal Doppler and fetal Doppler, uh, this can increase the sensitivity and specificity. Fetal Doppler should be avoided or not prolonged it first trimester. This is a caution. And other uh, imaging such CT scan, low dose CT scan has also come up, ultra low dose CT scan and role of MRI. So I'll just briefly touch. Non-contrast CT uh, scan is gold standard for the diagnosis of nephro okay. in the general population. It should be avoided in pregnancy due to concern about fetal radiation. But in last three decades, we have seen that the CT is almost to that used to the tune of 25% every year. Is, is use is increasing. And this is important. These terms you should postgraduate should remember. Uh, radiation exposure classified as stochastic or deterministic. Deterministic is dose dependent. That means you know that five threshold, 10, 10 milli threshold, um, uh, above this th uh, threshold, there will be an, uh, uh, there will be uh, harmful effect to fetus. Stochastic means at any level of radiation exposure. It is, uh, you, know, you can say, idiopathic or uh, irrelevant. Any, any college of uh, 
obstetric and gynecologist, no association between radiation dose of 50 milli greater or less than 5 plates and fetal memory of pregnancy loss, but spontaneous abortion risk, uh, risk diminished IQ dose more than 10 rate at gestation of 3 weeks. And 5 to 10 rates, we don't know, it may or may not affect. Ultra low reduces the uh, CT to almost 0 0.35, safe for diagnostic use in pregnancy from the deterministic point of view. But as I mentioned, stochastic effects, you cannot always say there can be a theoretical effect of hematological malignancy, good sensitivity and specificity. EA you give it is a last line option. And in fact, we also don't very commonly use here CT scan. MRI is non anaging It is very well. Uh, you can use this. Images distinguish between physiological and pathological hydronephrosis. Uh, second line imaging modality, if USG is inconclusive, no deleterious, deleterious effect on developing fitness, uh, fetus and gadolinium should be avoided because it causes placenta. So you should not use. This is just a table to give you uh, imaging modality as per the radiation. You see ultrasound and MR is safe and then you can see XAKB IV. This is an important uh, slide for the postgraduate students. So guidelines according to AUA, USG is the first line of investigation. If USG is not confirmatory, then you can use MRU without contrast and low dose CT in the second or third trimester if it is really absolute. Otherwise, you should avoid using it. Conservative treatment and uh, what are the therapies? Let's see. Conservative treatment generally less than one centimeter, stable patient, no distress. And uh, majority, you know, 70 to 80 percent pass spontaneously. So there is a dilatation and their patient do pass a stone. We have seen, uh, I think every one of us seen in the... Uh, uh, practice and these are the places renal pelvis, uretic stone, and distribution of the stone. Pain management is avoided, and set should be avoided because fetal pulmonary hypertension as well as premature closure of the ductus atus is the one of the most important side effect of the NSAIDs. Hydration is important. Um, it increased risk of premature lower and mobility in the given patient with urethesis is always there because of the pain. Medical expulsion therapy is alpha blocker and calcium channel blockers are classified as category B drugs in pregnancy and are often used without any adverse effect. Both inhibits the peristaltic activity of ureter, so stone expulsion and decreases the calling, uh, colic episodes. However, there is a uh, there is still not a, con a consensus about MET therapy. AU guidelines support that if a, a MET is being advised in pregnancy, the patient should be warned that the uses of this drug in pregnancy is not well documented and they are being utilized for an off-label purpose. So this is very important uh, uh, message also by from wow. AUA. So these are some of the question. How many how many percentage will require intervention? What are the indications of intervention? What are the types of intervention? Which trimester is the best for intervention? Indication for temporary intervention. What are the benefits of temporary interventions? What are the methods of definitive treatment? And which are the best energy sources? Role of laser in urethesis in pregnancy. Are they safe? So I'm just answering that 20 to 30% of patients with ureter calculate during pregnancy will ultimately require active treatment. Can be temporary drainers or definitive treatment. Temporary is PCN or double gestant. Definitely you are doing URS and removing the stone. So uh, when you will do this, failure of concept with the treatment, unresolved symptoms, pain, progressive hydronephrosis, UTI, obstruction of a solitary kidney, progressive renal impairment, poor access to urological care related with pregnancy, such as preclamps and treatment of labor, and decent involvement of experienced obstetrician and perinatologist. So uh, avoid the intensive treat, uh, treat, invasive treatment during uh, first trimester to do an active treatment, second trimester is better. Temporary option when you have a lot of, lot of big stone burden, you know that you cannot finish in very small uh, uh, period or a complex anatomy. Obstetric concerns are there or the, where they're presented in the early or the late in the pregnancy and absolute uh, this is Advantages of temporary interventions are they're very less in very quick. You can do lo local anesthesia without radiation exposure, decreases the pain, and patient gets relieved. Definitely stone management. Generally, you can have URS as well as documented. But URS is the preferred line of treatment, and uh, got stone cleanse with low complication rate. And URS in pregnancy with uretic stone have stone stone free reads almost the same you see achieve in non-pregnant rate about 
lithotriptan energy sources pneumatic and holmium bridges are safe electrohydrochloric lithotriptan you should avoid ultrasonic you should not use because the high level of noise can reach up to 98 decibel and affect petal ear development fluoroscopy equity this is for everybody to follow low dose and pulse fluoroscopy don't use continuous fluoroscopy uh, shielding the patient pelvis can reduce total radiation exposure you are going to include only the renal ear so you have to the collimation is always there you can reduce the you can uh, by the reducing the collimation you can uh, focus uh, we can avoid extra radiations so what are the do and don'ts during uterus in pregnancy right side of the abdomen slightly lifted to reduce the compression of the ivc by uterus digestion should be kept fetal monitoring early intervention and low pressure perfusion and short operation theater times its complications remains the same as uh, others obstetric complication can happen up to the tune of 4.3 percent pcnl is contraindicated some reports are there for supine pcnl esw is contraindicated don't use it and uh, so to conclude nephrolithiasis during pregnancy can be significant anxiety proving uh, provoking experience for all whether it's a uh, clinicians or whether the patient or the patient relatives morbidity for mother and fetus by increasing risk of obstetric complication ultrasound remains mainstay mru as a second line conservative treatment with met should be the initial management for mesotomy Uroscopic with holmium laser intracorporeal pneumolytic tripsy is safe and effective first line treatment can use in second uh, trimester and multidisciplinary approach is always great. So to take home message, if the patient is having a flank pain um, and you have uh, uh, nausea, vomiting, unexplained fever, recurrent UTI, and you have initial basic investigation that you do for urine routine culture, CBC, RFT, electrolytes. an ultrasound of the abdomen and pelvis you found stone yes patient require immediate intervention no then expected treatment is hydration pain control serial ultrasound if it is yes patient is not improving then you can do temporary digestanting pcn as i mentioned the benefits where you can do bilateral renal obstruction solitary kidney large stone burden active infection first trimester mustard deterring renal function or peak reps or preterm labor definitive treatment should be done reserved for second trimester and at this of the criteria indications and if you don't find stone in the ultrasound you may find in the mru then you can again come to this casket uh, mru can be used in first trimester pregnancy or where uh, low dose kit is that for second and third no stone found then it may be as i mentioned 30% patient can, can mimic uretric colic but they don't have the uretric colic thank you for your patient listening i'm stopping my screen uh, here and i will uh, straight away if rahul is there i'll invite rahul to uh, start his presentation yeah thank you arpit and very nice presentation very complete just for the benefit of consultants also uh, I, medical expensive therapy you have written so can yeah. you give a medical expensive therapy in, in pregnant females uh, uh, rahul we we do give but the word of caution is that you must tell patient there is no there is a uh, uh, i am asking because students are there that is why they should be knowing uh, I, i i do i do give in my practice i don't find any problem with it but you give the combination of tam solution and corticosteroid uh, i am not using steroids right i am using only alpha blockers ha uh, that we have to be clear because if you use steroids then there is a probability of developing cardiac problems in yes. this patient just for a caveat because students we are sitting with the students so it is very important what take home message they take with it very nice presentation agree for also. educating us also Yeah. Okay, now I uh, <laughs> I'll share my slides, and this is the most uh, the only part why we don't want to do a PCNL. So and that is the complications. But the most important thing, I hope my slides are visible. Uh, now it is. Now it and is. I'm, Make it full screen, Rahul. Make it full screen. Yeah. Now all ready to go, Rahul. Okay. okay. so uh, the complications of any procedure are important they are not only from examination point of view and even for the practical point of view so we should be aware of the complication and not afraid of complications because if you will operate the the complications are bound to happen so from uh, uh, point of view from the students lecture point of view how do you document complications it is very important you can't be very uh, vague like a ward boy or a general surgeon or a you know a simple uh, post graduate student once you are going for the exam you will be consultant next day you are a consultant so how do you document your complications is very important and especially in the era of medical legal cases so you i if you cannot mug this uh, chart the clement uh, indo score it's a modified clement indo score if you cannot uh, you know memorize it by heart at least you should be having this thing in your uh, laptop or uh, 
in the clinic you can have a chart there and almost all complications can be you know uh, done by this thing and with the start of your practice if you start following this you will be less in trouble and if you want to if you are inclined towards the uh, publications and things like that so you can have your data from the day one so the grade 2 and grade 3a are the most dreaded complications and the usual complications of pcnl and it is defined as a need for blood transfusions ureteric leakage for uh, almost for 24 hours and infection requiring additional antibiotics in addition to your the routine ones and the grade 3a is a renal hemorrhage during the uh, requiring angioembolization or intervention or post operative need for digestant placement for urinary leaks hemo or pneumothorax requiring chest drain tube in short any intervention if you need after pcnl it comes under grade 3a complication so if the examiner is asking you and he's expecting this thing of you uh, okay, any intervention or this is true for any surgical principle so remember intervention is grade 3a and grade 2 grade 2 is requirement for blood transfusion bleeding is the most important complication of pcnl now how do you classify bleeding for any other bleeding for a general surgical principle it, the timing is most important either it is an intraop perioperative or post operative immediate or secondary uh, hemorrhage the patient can come back to you after two weeks you are fine you have forgotten the patient and suddenly he lands up in your opd and he with a clot retention so how you classify that that is a secondary hemorrhage in a patient and others is uh, other classification is either arterial bleeding or venous bleeding and this is important for pcnl because the management will depend upon this type of bleeding what type of bleeding you are dealing with so commonly in the exam it is asked the x ray would be shown and they they will ask you Okay, what puncture you will take if you have if you are having any blunder or something so the common question is what is the incidence of bleeding remember one one to five percent is a normal incidence of bleeding whatever type of stone you are doing blood transfusion rates are variable depending on type of the stone you are doing if you are doing a staghorn then may go up to about 20 percent but if you are not doing a simple stones it is 3.5 percent which has really come down with the start with the use of a mini pcnl Needing for angioembolization, it's less than 1%. Always remember that. And nephrectomy, if somebody asks you in the exam that would you explain nephrectomy to the patient, so your answer should be yes, sir. I would explain with a caveat that the incidence is 1 in 1,000. So, But you have to explain this uh, option to the patient, especially if you don't have access to angioembolization and unfortunately you injured a infundibular artery. So bleeding from PCNL, it, is, it may be from a skin incision. It may be a simple muscle bleed. It may be an intercostal artery. You have just put a knife, poked a knife inside and you have punctured an artery and you will get a lot of bleeding from there. Or it is from the rena, uh, the kidney itself, which may be a parenchymal bleed, infundibular tear, following a pelvic perforation. Or if the inflamed pelvis and you are integrating, disintegrating the stone with the lithoclast, again, you can have some bleeding and oozing from that. So what are the risk factors? Which calyx will bleed more, upper, middle or lower calyx? Uh, any of the calyx can bleed. Usually it is said that the uh, upper calyx is more likely to bleed than the lower calyx. Single or multiple punctures, it is important. Experience of the surgeon and supine or prone, no difference has been uh, delineated. Now, upper calyx puncture, solid Interrupted voice is there. Uh, Your voice is breaking, Rahul. Uh, the examiner is well researched, which has given you the answers. Yeah, good. Rahul, are you there? I think we have lost signal from Rahul. Just give us a minute. I'm sure you must be making some arrangement. I think uh, Rahul is having some internet issue. Yeah, I, I, I feel so, sir. Just give us a minute if it's not done. Yeah, yeah. to start. You can give me a call. Uh, I see Nitesh ready with his presentation. Just give us a minute, sir. I'll just call Rahul. If there is no, if there is a break, uh, Rahul is. Uh, Rahul, what's the problem? Should I start, Nitesh? Yeah.
हाँ हम लोग का चल रहा हम लोग तुमको नहीं देख पा रहे तुम्हारी आवाज चल ओके 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 राइट राहुल इज कमिंग बैक नेट इशू दिस समथिंग इज अनप्रेक्टिव इन ऑनलाइन एरा Raul got Raul got his connection back. He's just connecting. Raul, net problem or clock problem? Yes. <laughs> Looks like a net problem. Uh, Nitesh, you be ready with the presentation. I'll What? just for a minute. If Raul is connected, <laughs> fine. Otherwise, yes, I'm ready. But cut it again, bro. Oh, okay. Okay. Ah, so last we connect, we'll connect you. We have some time. Okay. Okay. Bye. Right. Thanks, sir. नितेश करो नितेश राहुल का प्रॉब्लम हो रहा है Technique of renal PCS access discussion and question and answer we will take at the end. And Nitesh will also give us a insight into extended uh, uh, parlothotomy. Okay, so uh, Nitesh, you start. Uh, Rahul will join us as soon as his connection is stable. Uh, just I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, I don't know what happened, but something okay. happened. Back. So we want to finish, Rahul. Yeah, yeah. Let uh, me uh, finish because that will be good for everyone. Okay. Hardly any slides okay. left now. Hello. राहुल का कनेक्शन आ गया जम्मू से कनेक्शन कभी भी आई आई डोंट डोंट नो नो क्या हुआ समथिंग एनीवेज जस्ट या या प्लीज फिनिश ऑफ राहुल राहुल प्रॉब्लम विद स्लाइड्स आर विजिबल मेक इट गुड मेक इट फास्ट सो रेट इज एज आई वॉज डिस्कसिंग समथिंग कैंडिडेट वॉट आर द रिस्क फैक्टर्स फॉर ब्लीडिंग it is upper calyx puncture solitary kidney stagon stones multiple uh, punctures and inexperienced uh, surgeon other include the tract size that is very important that is why mini pcn has come as a standard now uh, methodology of tract dilatation single versus balloon uh, ckd patients are more uh, like likely to bleed and complexity of stone whenever we are talking about complexity of stone i think we have heard about the guy's stone score uh, which which all candidates should know it's very easy score there are four scores given depending on the severity or the the type of stone you are dealing and the ease of puncture and uh, the risk of bleeding so that is very important for all of us now how do you grade the bleeding or hematuria uh, ideally uh, normally in the we look at the color which is the basic common sense and uh, you can grade it with the grading scale if it is available in the ward or this is one of the papers which was published in urology 2021 which has given us this very basic thing and the routine thing we normally follow but don't uh, you know uh, follow to the extent like documentation so grade 1 it is just a small tinge of bleeding and grade 4 uh, is a severe amount of bleeding as we can see in this the, the depiction is there so you can always ask uh, somebody to click a photograph of the tube and send it to you and you can always see if it is a significant bleeding or not so uh, like this it is a clear pink uh, or a bloody cherry red color bleeding so how do you define bleeding uh, hemodynamically unstable patient recurrent clot retentions when uh, the adjusted decrease in hemoglobin is more than 3 grams or 3 and a half grams uh, it should the patient should be prepared for uh, uh, angioembolization if that is not available prepare the patient for nephrectomy saving the life is takes a prime over saving an organ always remember that and that should be the answer in the examination also so uh, how to uh, overcome this thing the learning curve is there know your limitations miniaturization of the tract and your procedure well so as to prevent the bleeding other complications are uh, the uh, post op pneumothorax uh, which is one of the known bleedings it is not which is not unknown 
and especially this can happen after the uh, supracostal puncture. It usually happens after the supracostal punctures. So pneumothorax uh, looks like a pneumothorax, but when you put a tube inside, it may come out to be a hydro or a hemothorax. There may be pleural effusion, simple pleural effusion or uh, pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome if the patient has gone into uh, the complete frank sepsis. So the treatment is, the most important component is if your patient has dyspnea and the saturation is fluctuating and you put a stetho, sometimes you may not hear, but if you're, if it is a completely silent chest, then suspect uh, in a supracostal puncture, a pneumothorax, which is not an unknown complication. And the incidence is between 5 to 15%, depending on if you are supra 12th or supra 11th. So the putting a chest drain tube is the immediately, and that can save the patient. Within 48 hours, if somebody asks you, there is a pneumothorax, what would you do? Put a chest drain, put a stent in the kidney, wait for 48 hours, repeat an x-ray and remove the tube and the patient should be fine. Colonic injuries, they are not unknown, but fortunately, the incidence is less than 1%. Uh, the risk factors are in case of elderly patients, retro, re, retro renal colons, uh, horseshoe kidneys, jejuno ileal bypass patients, uh, hypermobile kidneys, kyphoscoliosis, they are all sort of patients who can predispose to colonic injuries. Presented with fecal discharge, this is, this is the presentation which can be there in the watch. And this is what you can see if you do an RGP, the contrast is going into the colon. This is uh, sometimes the presentation if the the your the nephrostomy has you know shift back to the colon. So treatment. This is a common question which is asked in the exam. How do you treat a nephrocolonic fistula? You uh, pay, put the patient in NBM immediately or start the TPN if the patient is uh, you know it's not very uh, it's it's compromised. Broad spectrum antibiotics is the first thing you want to do. Place a stent if it is not there. Withdraw the nephrostomy under fluoro guidance. Never uh, withdraw it blindly with the approximation and check if there is a uh, it is come, comes and lies into the colon. Anal dilatation is, is advised so that the distal passage should be patent. And do a dye study, 7th or 10th day, document there is no, no connection between the kidney and the colon, and then you can safely remove the uh, nephrostomy. This is, uh, these are some of the x-rays, and th these x-rays can come as radiology in, your, uh, in the exam, and if it is there, you should not get surprised. You should always ask for a CT scan. It is an investigation of choice. If you are confused on an RGP, somebody showing you an RGP picture only, ask them to please show me the CT. And there you can see the leak. And you can say it is a nephrocolonic fistula. So the other part of the management will be decided by the fact that either it is an intra or a retroperitoneal uh, fistula. So retroperitoneal, I have already explained how do you manage that. But if it's an intraperitoneal fistula, you, there you have to explore the patient. And you have to do the things. The supine versus prone. Initially, we thought uh, supine uh, will cause more, but it has been a known fact that in prone position, the incidence of retro renal colon is 10%, vis a vis in supine position where it is 1%. Remember these percentages because they are important. And in the exam, uh, somebody would expect you to tell them. So, this is the relationship of the kidney and the colon. You can see it on the, uh, uh, the x rays. And it will depend upon whether the previous history of surgery is there or not also. It is important in that patient. And it can also please dispose of the So this is all the complications we uh, usually encounter. And uh, that is all, Harpreet, I, I wanted to, I hope they will understand. And these questions, now what questions we'll ask will depend on how attentive these candidates were during our presentations. <laughs> Thank you, Rahul. Uh, for an excellent presentation on uh, you have summed up very nicely and you have covered almost most important part of the which everybody should know for the exam point of view over to you nitesh and then uh, i'm very happy that we are going uh, almost before time so that we have a lot of time for discussion everybody complains we don't have time for discussion here we are going to because we have uh, shivaji da and we have pal sir here with us so we we'll like to listen to the uh, to their ex experience Yeah, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, seniors and uh, the students who are here. Uh, you are talking on techniques of renal access. Uh, the thing is, you cannot finish until you start a thing. So, in PCNL, initial puncture tract is the first mandate for the renal access. To disclaim, the video contents are taken from EAU educational videos, Dr. S.K. Paul, Dr. Sasikant Misra, and the supine puncture videos are mine. First, going there, we should see the basic anatomical consideration. 
we can see that uh, the kidneys the they are inclined almost 30 degrees to the frontal plane and also the upper poles are almost tilted towards the midline they are also almost 30 degrees so the upper poles are medial and more posterior the most important thing is the blood supply of the kidney when we see the kidney rece receives almost one fourth of the blood supply that the heart pumps and the kidney filters to remove the waste and the most important complication of pcnl is the hematuria so we need to be very much meticulous about the puncture that we should not injure any blood vessels. When we see the blood supply, there are four anterior and one posterior vessels and it fans out in the periphery. And the least amount of density as in corrosion cast and in the broadal line, and you can see it's almost at in and around the broadal line, which is a direct entry into the posterior calyx. And in the corrosion cast also, you can see that in periphery, the density of the blood vessels are quite low. So coming to the techniques of renal access, I will discuss on the fluoroscopic guided techniques, the PC guided technique, the USC guided technique, and mostly the fluoroscopic guided technique, that is the bullseye triangulation and a gradual descent technique. The others will be touched upon. So, before going there, we should first understand the fluoroscopy and its relative movement. This is important to know the medial lateral extent to know whether we are superficial or deep to the things. And for this, we need to use the three arm in two different planes. One is zero degree position and one is 30 degree position. If we see all these dots, when we see from here, all these dots will appear in the straight line. But when we see from the another angle, the dots orientation will change. This is the movement or relative movement. When you can see all the blue lines, when we see from 30 degree, will appear on the same point. But when we move to zero degree, they will change their orientation and the position. The superficial ones will move away and the lateral, one, the deeper ones will move towards the midline. So this is the three case scenarios we'll discuss. At one is superficial, one is deep, and one is at the level. So this is the first scenario. Uh, needle was 30 degree and then when we move the needle to 0 degree, the needle has moved away from midline or towards you. It means that the needle is superficial. The second scenario again moving from 30 to 0, you can see the needle has moved medially towards the midline means that the needle is much deeper. And there is the third scenario in which uh, even moving from 30 to 0 degree, the position of the needle and the calyx is almost the same means that you are on the correct side or correct plane and depth. So, coming to the first technique, eye of the needle or the bullseye technique, this is called eye of the needle because everything we see through the eye of the needle. In this technique, uh, CM is uh, rotated 30 degree towards the, towards the surgeon and then the needle, the calyx, desired calyx, CM, X-ray view, everything is oriented that all falls in a straight line and then uh, we go to zero degree for the depth assessment we go on moving like in this uh, we go on moving deeper 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 and at a point we'll move rotate the cm again back to zero degree to just to see that whether we are superficial or deep in this case uh, use of hemostate has been shown to minimize the radiation to the to the hands of the surgeon this we are pushing deeper, deeper, deeper in the 30 degree plane. And then to check, we are going back to zero degree. And we can see that, that uh, the points in zero degree and 30 degree are almost the same. So the needle is in position. We draw the stillet and see the water reflux. If the water is coming nicely and the guide wire is passing, you are inside. The second technique is a gradual descent biplanar technique. In this, what we do is we do not go from the point, we do not enter from this point, but we move laterally in the skin and we enter from a lateral point so that we can avoid much medial punctures and we go through more, more towards the broader line. So in this, what we do that uh, we orient ourselves and go with a zero degree position. And if it's a failed attempt, it's a needle is passing without 
puncturing the system without entering the system. Then again, there's a second scenario in which we can access whether the needle is superficial or deep. What we can do is tilt the CM towards 30 degree towards the surgeon side or towards the head of the patient. And then we can see whether the needle is moving towards the foot or towards the head. If the needle is moving towards the feet, it means it is superficial. Uh, this is the real case scenario in which uh, the posterior calyx, upper posterior calyx has been filled with air and the surgeon is trying to puncture that. So he is using the gradual descent method and with experience is approaching the calyx. Now, now we can see that he has turned the CM towards 30 degree towards the head. You can see the respective movement. These sheets are deeper. The black line which is moving, it's the sheet. The sheet is deeper, that's why it's moving towards the head. And the calyces which are in the needle are all are moving almost at the same plane. So means that it is inside and the guide wire is passing. Another puncture in the same patient to show the same thing. Again, he is going with a gradual descent. He went in and to access, he again moved the CM towards the head inside. And we can see that all the points are coinciding and the passes of guide wire confirms the puncture. Uh, this is a gradual descent monoplana in which it's a purely experience kind of thing. You do not to rotate the CM and you have to adjust the depth with your experience. And with this comes after 100, 200 cases that whether you are superficial or deep, you can just adjust and go in. In this, what... Uh, is done that in zero degree only or 30 degree, whatever can be done. If this is a fail attempt, then again, needle is withdrawn and with experience, it's just put in. Uh, a, real, a real case scenario in which surgeon is pointing towards the calyx and going on. Now he's trying to feel the kidney. In the first, <clears throat> in the first attempt, you cannot see the movement of the kidney. There is no, not much movement of the kidney and also no indentation of the calyx. Now in the second attempt, you can see the kidney is moving and there is an indentation of the calyx and you feel, uh, you get a getaway sensation. So you are inside, you withdraw, you get a water, clear water or methylene blue, whatever you have used and you have confirmed that you have entered it, the system. This is the most uh, taught technique and uh, simple technique where your bullseye fails. And this is the second technique which <coughs> everyone is taught. In this triangulation technique, we calculate two points A and B and with this, we calculate the point B1 and we try to puncture the system. What we do in this, we mark a point A on the screen and a zero degree. We move the C arm towards the 30 degree and mark a point B on the screen. And then we do some mathematical calculation. We assume this uh, two as a circular arc and we calculate it as a x. If x is 30 degrees, then 360 degrees is 12x. With this formula, we calculate the depth, whatever depth which is required to go in. And assuming with these two points as the equilateral triangle, we create a third point on the caudal aspect or cranial aspect, whatever the scenario may be. And we try to move in such as we are moving at the tip or of the pyramid caused by the three triangles. And we go at a depth of R and we go inside. This is the triangulation in a real life scenario. And this uh, guidance of the target is achieved by multiple rotations of 0 and 30 degree. In this uh, separate uh, scenario or separate method has been shown that to remove the surgeon's hand from field of radiation, the CM is tilted 30 degree towards the head of the patient so that the hands will be free of radiation and then at a 30 degree, uh, the movements of 0 and 30 degree are done. And with these multiple 0 and 30 degree rotations, the targeting will be done. Now, you can see the needle is advanced coaxially and the CM is rotated 30 degree. With 30 degree, again, the puncture path is readjusted to meet the calyx at 0 degree. So, with this, the puncture path is adjusted and once we go in, we can get the desired calyx and the fluid. This is a real life scenario in which he is going and he is moving back and forth from 0 to 30 degree and he is reorienting his needle again and again to meet the desired calyx. And see in the insect. 
30 and 0 and he can puncture and pass a guide wire. Uh, this is a supine monoplanar technique. Just a minute. Nitish, everything is pleased. Are you there? Yes, yes. Everything is going good. I want to show a different video. It's not of me. Uh, just a few seconds, sir. Nitish, are you there? With yes, you? yes. I'm here. One minute, sir. Okay. But look, everything is freezed. Okay, right. Yeah, this is a, a video in which uh, we are showing a supine biplanar puncture. And uh, you can see the RGP. Uh, the same thing is being shown. And when we move the CM towards the head, this was the first scenario in which the needle was superficial. The needle has moved down. Now, there's a second scenario in which we are trying to place the needle beneath the patient so that it's below the target calibre, it's deeper. And when we are moving the uh, CM towards the head, it is moving upwards. You can see the motion of the gases also, the colonic gas shadow also, because it is superficial, it will move towards the leg. And this is the third scenario in which we are trying to puncture. We are going in with a gradual descent and with experience, we are trying to feel the moment of the kidney. The first part, the kidney was not moving. Second pass also, the kidney was not moving. The third pass, we can get a nice moment of the kidney and we are in. And we are confirming the puncture by again moving the CM towards the head. You can see the colon shadow moving downwards. We are again back to the zero degree and we confirm with uh, the coming out of the urine, clear urine, and passage of the guide wire confirms the puncture. So this is a supine biplanar puncture. Uh, this is a supine monoplanar puncture in which uh, we are putting a stab incision and then we are going in. Again, you can see in the first pass, there was not much movement of the kidney and the calicial indentation was not there. So we readjust and then move in again. And in the second pass, you can see both the movement of the kidneys and the calicial indentation. And then we can go inside and it's confirmed by clear passage of the fluid. Now coming to the USD guided puncture, in this uh, video by Dr. Sasikant Mishra, he has put a uretic catheter. All that you need is a USG and a machine should have a needle guide. And there's an attachment with uh, the USG Pro which can hold the needle and which can dictate your angle of puncture. Now this is directly attached with the USG Pro and then USG is done from the medial to lateral direction. You just you select your desired calyx, you in, install the, instill the fluid so that the calyces uh, become dilated or open up, put a stab incision, then you go in and you can see everything in real time and can see how the needle is going inside and the, when you puncture, the confirmation is by clear water. 
can sometimes you can complete the procedure with the USG guidance only. Some are doing without any fluoroscopy completing the procedure, but it's better to take a help of fluoroscopy in the initial days. Now the question arises: which techniques to learn? So my thoughts or my advice will be start with whatever you're taught. If you're taught triangulation, do triangulation. If you're taught both sides, do with both sides. And then you, after you get uh, a number of cases in your belt, and then you can man adjust or then you can switch over to gradual descent, biplanar, then gradual descent, monoplanar. And at last, when you are uh, very keen with a gradual descent, monoplanar, biplanar, you can also switch to supine PCN. So everything will change with experience. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm done with the first one. If questions we are taking later, sir. Sir? Perfect, sir. Harpreet? Are you sleeping? Harpreet? <clears throat> Oh, no, sir. I lost the connection. I just got it back. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Nitin, sir, question is? Or no? Yeah. Are you going to a second presentation, Nitish? Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. You finish in the next 10 minutes so that we have a lot of time for discussion because targets are here. So, we should be able to have their opinion. And guidance. So, uh, after talking about techniques of access coming from a such an advanced thing, USG guided, neuroscopy guided, then this uh, RIRS guided, coming back to extended pyloorthotomy is not a, it will not seem a good thing, but when I read or when we are doing, when we are taught in the UG, uh, PG days and we are training days, it is a very good, robust surgery. And nowadays the things have shifted. It was once an era of open surgery and now we are replicating every step of open surgery in our robotics and laparoscopy. So extended pyelolithotomy still has a role, may not be open, but nowadays robotic and laparoscopic. So let's reconsider what this gentleman, Dr. Gilbernet, has taught us way back in 1965. So you get a case like this, a large stack on calculus, maybe much bigger calculus with all the branches. What we will do? Uh, many will say I'll do a multi uh, function, multi track PCNL. Many will say I'll do a laparoscopy. Many will say. But when we are taught, uh, when in our PG days, if stone like this comes, the primary dictum was we go in, either we will get all the things from the pelvis or we'll open up the kidneys. And anatomic lithotomy was the first thought. So this uh, work by Dr. Gilbert, he has removed the stone in total. So <clears throat> why we are talking about extended pyelolithotomy? Because when we see the anatrophic pyelolithotomy, anatrophic nephrolithotomy, it involved the incision of the kidney. It involved incision of the kidney in the broadal spleen and even multiple small nephrolithotomies so there was a there was need to completely mobilize the kidney. There was a need to uh, clamp the vessels. There was there was a need to open up the kidneys. There was bleeding, and there was much more other complications like the urinoma, then spasm of the vessels. There was loss of uh, kidney function and all those things. So what what Dr. Gilbert used that he this studied the renal sinus and these things in detail and he came up with the idea that there's a very loose areolar tissue and loose areolar connection between the kidney parenchyma, the capsule and the pelvic caliceal system and the fat. So he used that we could go beneath the sinus and we could extend our pyelolithotomy and we can avoid these complications. This idea that extended pyelolithotomy was done. Now I'll show you a short video. You can see a surgeon is, has already totally mobilized the kidney. Okay, its kidney is almost in hands. Whatever we are taught, bring the kidney in your hand. 
and you can see the he has also used a, a sling a watch watch sling to hold the kidney and pull it more towards you so it's in tension and all the attachment all the natural boundaries you are uh, dismantling and then putting back again now it was a vertical pilotomy what he has used taking a stay and then a uh, vertical pilotomy is done the vertical pilotomy has been made now he is trying to extend because the stone is larger it won't come out now he is trying to extend his incision what he has done that he is going inside he is cutting the kidney he is doing nephro nephrotomy and suddenly there is a gush of blood now he has to catch hold of that bleeder it's bleeding 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 so all these complications can be avoided with the nephrolithotomy so uh, i have already told that uh, these things can be avoided now what gilbernet told us that even to avoid the lump oblique lumbotomy incision the oblique lumbotomy incision will traverse from tip of the 12th or tip of the 11th rib and it will go forward towards the umbilical and in doing so it uh, most of the time it will traverse the it will transact the nerve most of the time it will transact the subcostal nerve and the vessels and uh, it will cause some harm to the patient patient will be in agony the muscles will be cut and there will be some problem so what he decided to not to do the oblique lumbotomy incision the second principle what we what he told was to stop extruding the kidney from itself so we are not uh, allowed or he told that it's not needed or mandatory to mobilize the whole kidney from its uh, bed so that the new additions do not develop the ptosis of the kidney do not develop and the fibrosis also do not develop and what is also told that when we do the pyelolithotomy the fascia of the pelvis will grow thick and will cause some constrictive factor so this was the vertical pyelotomy and in this what he told uh, incision was made outside the kidney and it was closed in a vertical fashion so there is always a chance of leakage of urine there is always a chance that adhesions will develop and patients will have some amount of days in the hospital now all these complications will increase in stagon calculus because there will be multiple uh, pilotomies there will be multiple incisions in the kidney and the drain need of drain the duration of the drain the pain and uh, you know my everything was increased during that time so he devised a posterior lumbotomy incision or it was a uh, earlier also so what we do in posterior lumbotomy incision is this is the midline uh, this is the midline then we mark the lateral border of the spinae muscle we mark the 12th rib and the iliac crest and with this the lateral border of the spinae muscle we mark we do our incision up to the iliac crest like this this is the incision and this is the patient position patient lies on a or laterally on the table and the table is broken up so in what are the things we traverse we traverse the skin the subcutaneous fascia and then we go to the aponeurosis of the latissimus dorsi sorry to interrupt yep. can you wrap up can you wrap up yep. in the next two three minutes okay sir. two minutes five minutes sir. so we go in and we use approach the kidney i will skip the video of posterior lumbotomy and uh, what we do after we go go to the kidney we flip the kidney this side so that everything falls in front of us uh, early approach to the renal sinus was intracapsular means we the, the capsule of the kidney was denuded and then we will go beneath the capsule of the kidney this was the thoracos technique later on the extracapsular capsular approach came and in this approach uh, gilbernet described that there is a sinus fibrous band and there is a multiple tissue sinus tissue loose area tissue in between this and there is a very good plane and we can extend our uh, dissection up to that so 
histopathology also shows the similar kind of thing. So this is the actual step. We start onto the ureter. We dissect out the fascia and we stay onto the ureter. We go in and as soon as we encounter that uh, fascia, the closure of the hilum by the condensation of the capsule, we insert our scissors and make it open so that it opens up with resistance. After it opens up, we do a blind or a blind dissection with a gauze or mop. And then we use the galvanic retractors to make open this area. And then we can move to the pilotomy incision. For a stagnant calculus occupying all the calyces, a vertical pilotomy which can be extended into upper and lower pole is done. And for the other stones also, it describes the same incision. We also describe the caliciotomy cali incision for this. And for the closer, it can be done on the same fashion. After closing, after we re remove the uh, retractors, the kidneys uh, almost fall upon to the suture line and there is almost no leak. So he did his surgery without any drains. Uh, these are the galvanic retractors. Uh, same thing was studied uh, in detail with a large number of case series was with Blandy. And nowadays recent papers, uh, one in 2018, it described everything in robotic and it, that there was an extended pilot lithotomy and he removed the stack on calculus made upon a DJ stand with this technique. And he used the same principles of Gilbernet extended pilot lithotomy. Uh, a similar case was reported by Dr. Rishi Nair in uh, recent years. He has also done a similar extra uh, intrarenal sinus dissection and then the removal of the stone. In this, uh, you can see we almost extended up to the calyx. Thank you. If there's a time, I will like to show the dorsal lumbotomy incision in a minute. We do next time, Nitish. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay. I appreciate. Uh, uh, I appreciate your help that you did the proxy for protein, and last moment uh, you chipped in for this uh, presentation. You really. Uh, very well, you have de demonstrated you have not only shown extended pilototomy but the different approaches to the kidney. And I, I do feel as uh, extended pilototomy is still a very good, uh, very, very good surgery. Actually, we don't touch the uh, nephron. I'm sure Shivaji Da and Palsa will have will add a lot to it. They must have seen and they must have done so many in their time. Uh, so, with this, uh, the uh, we wrapped up the presentation. I invite both Dr. Shivaji Da and Dr. Paul for their comments and then we'll ask students to ask their questions and whatever the doubts they clear. Over to Shivaji Da. Thank you, Harpit. Uh, now, just wondering whether we should start asking questions uh, with each of the, 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 the topics we discussed from the start and the Starting with the metabolic evaluation to the pregnancy and then to the how about that? I mean, there's nothing to comment really because everyone spoke so high in this limited time, and that was you know not everything they could cover. Uh, we could we could cover, but most of the things were covered. What were not covered, we can discuss and it will come out with the questions and answer. Right. Yeah. Uh, can, can all the residents will switch on their videos and then can can you can you all come online and uh, can you can you ask questions to so if you have any questions on metabolic please go ahead ask Dr Sandeep is there to clear the doubts. Well, let me ask the basic question to the uh, the students. I mean, you have if you have heard the. Uh, uh, talk for Sandeep, some of the things. So basically, who are the candidates who will need uh, stone screening for the primary stone formers? Will all the primary stone formers need their stone screening and stone investigation? Any, anyone who, who will be coming, who will answer? <laughs> Uh, and Dr. Uh, Weber, sure. can you take this question? Yeah, go ahead, please, Dr. Weber. Dr. 
come on, come on. Who, who is going to answer? Sir, uh, I, I will answer, sir. Please. May I answer, sir? Please do. Yes. Uh, Sir, there are two uh, uh, protocols for uh, evaluation, uh, metabolic evaluation of stone disease. One is uh, abbreviated, uh, abbreviated evaluation protocol and another is complete evaluation protocol. Uh, in abbreviated evaluation protocol, sir, uh, any patient uh, diagnosed with stone disease uh, may undergo abbreviated uh, uh, um, evaluation protocol after uh, treatment of uh, his or her stone disease. In abbreviated uh, protocol, we take the complete history, we do physical examinations, and uh, we do basic uh, blood biochemistry, such as uh, routine blood count, uh, urea creatinine, sodium potassium, uh, blood calcium values, and we do uh, spot urine uh, analysis uh, uh, on urinary pH, uh, mainly urinary pH, and if there is any uh, presence of stone uh, crystals or not. And uh, sir, uh, uh, finally, we do stone analysis after uh, we get the stone after operation, uh, after surgery. So this is the abbreviation stone protocol. And for complete uh, evaluation, uh, who are the candidates for con complete evaluation? Uh, those who are high risk stone former uh, that we get in abbreviated stone evaluation from the history, uh, and in case of recurrent stone former and uh, in pediatric population also, or if the patient is willing for his uh, complete uh, metabolic evaluation, then we will go for uh, complete metab metabolic evaluation. And it includes uh, uh, the, all the uh, abbreviated, uh, uh, all the uh, investigations in abbreviated protocol plus at least two uh, 24 hour urinary volume collection uh, on two uh, separate random days um, maintaining the uh, proper precautions and uh, this 24 hour urinary uh, uh, volume uh, should uh, include uh, the measurement of uh, total volume the urinary measurement of urinary creatinine uh, total ph uh, the total urinary calcium um, uh, uh, citrate level oxalate level uh, and total urinary phosphate level and urinary sulfate level also though sulfate level doesn't uh, necessarily correlate with pathogenesis of stone uh, measurement of sulfate level is important to get an idea how much animal protein uh, intake is there uh, so uh, this is uh, all about sir um, 24 hour urinary volume collection okay very good so basically all primary stone former you would like to do the basic pro uh, protocol Yes. Yes, sir. So, second one, for the extended one, you missed one point, was it? You said about the recurrent stone former, but you said that a, a strong family history is an indicator for elaborate stone tests. That's the one you missed. So, yes, sir. Second thing is that at the outset, you have noticed Sandeep, Dr. Sandeep said, what is the AUA definition of high risk recurrent stone formers? Not only is the primary stone former, the multiple stones in the kidney are also considered as a recurrent stone form. They are need a elaborate extensive one. We have said the good thing. We have uh, answered quite elaborately. So keep in mind the basic thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Who is going to ask question? Sandeep? No, oh, sir, it's okay, sir. You are first. Sandeep, do you have any answer? No, sir. For the moment? No, sir. That's uh, who else is there? So, no, where is Sanu? Where is Sanu? Make yourself uh, visible. Sonu. Sonu, two minutes of the renal tubular acidosis. Relevant point. What you understood about this? Did you, did you get my question, Sonu? 
one of the question is what do you understand about renal tubular acidosis by Dr. Sivaji Sir. It, it, it's relevant in metabolic, what you're talking in this, uh, the metabolic world. Yeah, go on. We haven't got much time. So, you touch every point. But not discussed. So, what you understood, the basic thing, what is it and how do you treat it? How do you diagnose it? Treat it? SK, good evening. Welcome. Good evening, sir. Sonu Patidar is muted. Unable to listen to him. Sonu, we can't hear you. Intentionally or unintentionally? We want to check up the case, the position. Or we are gone. What are our boys? Say it. Are you Said, where are they? Dr. Vaibhav, are you there? Vaibhav is there. The question was asked to Sonu. Sonu, are you can't, we can't hear you. I, I... Sonu, you are muted. Yeah. yeah, you are unmuted. Can you can you hear us? Uh, sir, I think you have to move to Dr. Jayad. Uh, uh, maybe... Sonu, you, you can uh, you can uh, disconnect and reconnect. Maybe there's some issue with the we, we can't. Can you, you. Can you answer? Uh, uh, yes, sir. We wanted two minutes. We cannot. There is no time to discuss in detail. I said, what the what do you? Concept you have got about renal tubular acidosis. What happens? How is it diagnosed? And what is the treatment? Uh, sir, uh, there are four, four types of uh, renal uh, uh, tubular uh, acidosis. The common type? Uh, in... There are the four types. Yes. Uh, in, in type one, sir, uh, there is a uh, 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 in type one, uh, 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 there is a more more chance of stone formation. In type type one, is due to the uh, uh, defect in the sir uh, distal uh, uh, con distal uh, convoluted tubules, and uh, uh, type two is uh, sir associated uh, 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 is due to the sir uh, uh, defect in the sir proximal convoluted tubules. Sir. Uh, so type 1 is a distal tubular acidosis. That's the common Yes, sir. So how do you diagnose? What is the hallmark? Uh, sir, in, in uh, this case, sir, uh, uh, there is a more chance of stone formation. And, uh, uh, sir, uh, it is uh, diag uh, diagnosed by, sir. Uh, uh, what is the urinary pH? Uh, sir, urinary pH is uh, sir less than uh, 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 five point five, sir. In uh, uh, type one, sir. Five, five, eight. Anyway, so how do you challenge? How do you uh, diagnose it? Confirm? It then is for the if it's a normal bicarbonate, challenge with the acidic thing. Uh, well, you have to read it down. It's ammonium chloride test. Sir. No about it. Okay, yes. another point. Because unless you read it, it will not be no point wasting time here. So you have to touch every point here. Okay. So we go up. Uh, happy. Yes, sir. <coughs> Harpreet, the yes, discussion sir. on uh, metabolic workup or the first talk by Sandeep uh, cannot be completed unless we talk briefly about this uh, renal tubular acidosis as well as hyperparathyroidism. If within two minutes each, if Sandeep can explain, because I don't think 
they are our many students and they are able to explain to all of us so if sandeep can tell us these two things in brief i think the metabolic workup will be completed sandeep and i'll just because i had shown everything in my ppt yeah you can you can you can you re uh, uh, just show it again yes sir this uh, was what paul sir has asked yes sir. you have a very fancy presentation i have seen it so for the benefit of everybody if you can re uh, yes sir i am coming sir thanks i will request everyone uh, there is a uh, there is a request from president sir that anybody please any doubts please clear this is the right platform so i am requesting all of you you can please feel free to ask no, briefly platform. briefly yes, sandeep can explain how to diagnose and how to treat renal tubular acidosis and similarly hyperparathyroidism without the help of slides also if you can tell us so okay. we can complete the topic yeah so as they have said sir rta there are mainly four types so we have to first uh, diagnose i'll just show my slide yeah please go sandeep sandeep you can share us screen yes sir also we would like your comments after sandeep about the uh, the most important uh, part of the pcnl about the access so we like you to uh, give your insight and share your thoughts uh, with us with the junior colleagues so that uh, they feel more confident about it once sandeep finishes please share your thoughts about that so if uh, then should we move on if sandeep is not ready with the slides or yes sir to the second yes, topic can you can you can you, uh, can you uh, enlighten our younger colleagues sandeep uh, it will take some time or <laughs> some glitches with the net so meanwhile we can ask uh, dr harpreet yes sir the cases of uh, stone in pregnancy actually there have been various studies and you have nicely covered the whole topic the only thing is the doubt regarding any teratogenic effect of the alpha blockers yes sir what which we usually use for expulsion of stone so you have mentioned that they are safe but is there any particular trimester and anything more about that not 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 sir not sir not sir sir what um, uh, you can use alpha blocker there are no proven um, uh, um, so far any teratogenic effect but there is a word of caution that you, uh, at the end there is no consensus over there are two groups they say offline you can tell patient and you can use i don't use steroids i don't use any other uh, calcium channel blockers but alpha blockers i do use my practice only thing i want to give a caution to everybody i just one question i want to ask students uh, to yes. answer caution what type of stones are there in pregnancy calcium phosphate calcium phosphate calcium phosphate is the most common and will you like to give will you like to give potassium citrate in pregnancy so no will you like to give uh, 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 you can, would you like to uh, uh, prescribe potassium citrate in pregnancy? If yes, why? If no, why? So the pregnant in pregnancy urine is alkaline, so there is no point okay. giving no point. Uh, or calcium phosphate stone. So you don't prescribe potassium citrate. It's not recommended in the pregnancy. The, uh, what Paul sir has asked, see, medical expulsion therapy. Though we have not settled the dust on it, but I think most of us use, and we are. I think our experience is same. Medical, medical it has left us, AU has left us on us on our personal uh, judgment whether to use it or when not to use it. Yes, Paul sir, uh, uh, Shivaji da. Uh, medical expulsion therapy basically works the distal. Yes, sir. Absolutely. If it works. Nothing else in the not even in the pregnancy in the renal or anything. So they are dilated anyway. So if, if there is a doubt, 
why use the medical expression of therapy? That is the one question you have to ask that one. The second point I want to raise, and I want to ask Vaiva, if the patient had an obstructed kidney and an infection, sepsis in the pregnancy period, what antibiotic would you use and what are the preferred antibiotics? So second generation cephalosporins are absolutely safe in the pregnancy. I use them and uh, I also do uh, percutase nephrostomy. It's very safe. It just do ultrasound guided puncture. In fact, I wanted to show one case in Walser asked me. I have a case where the patient presented in second trimester. She has count of 17,000 and she was having febrile. She was not settling. We did a PCN and she settled down. And in fact, it's, I tell you one very uh, interesting thing also that once you do a PCN, the small stones itself passes when the decompression takes place. It's very, very effective therapy. You can say it works as a small hybrid. A hybrid. Wala. Desi I, joga na, so chota hota aur patla hota. Uh, I'm asking Salma about the list yes. of antibiotics you can use and antibiotics you have to avoid. One, two, three, one. Sir, most common is the second gen second okay. generation cephalosporin. Okay. Yes, aug augmenting, sir. The amoxicillin group. Sir, that. Uh, that is asking what antibiotics you will avoid. What, what antibiotics you, will not you can use, but what antibiotics you will avoid? That is the question. Sir, uh, fluoroquinolone group antibiotics should be avoided. Which? Fluoroquinolone group. Yes, good. good. That's the one yes. that I want to do. Because yes. that is that may be teratogenic. Amino glycosides. Will you like to use amino glycosides? Amino glycosides. Amino glycosides should be avoided, sir. Yes, it should be avoided. Yes. So couple of points are very safe. Uh, Penicillin group is also seen, but since urine is a gram negative thing, so um, uh, couple of points works better in that. <clears throat> if you are you are using, you can use cefiroxim. Cefiroxim is very safe. You can give it. And uh, it's very safe in pregnancy. Well, you have, you have listened to Dr. Dr. Harpreet's wonderful uh, talk. Uh, now, what you could absorb there about the biggest stenting or conservative versus the patient has got a non -ob is an obstructive, painful stone in the urethra. You use your conservative or you could give a stick or you could give a percutaneous nephrostom. Which one is your choice and why? Have you got my point? I can't get it. Sir, may I answer, sir? Yes, please. What are the other two? Go on, sir. Sir, there is a bilateral obstruction, or there is a large bladder stone, or there is an active infection, or any deteriorating function. So, we, in this case, we can uh, uh, use PCN or digestion. Now, what is the disadvantage of being digested, and what is the advantage of digestion? In pregnancy, I'm not saying about anything else. But it's easier to put a digestion than a PCN, and you have. But the sad part is you have to keep changing the next nine months. You may have to change it times. Yes. Sir. Second point is the most important. Pregnancy is always a chance of encrustation of the crust. Stent. More encrustation than in normal. Uh, individual without a pregnancy. So there is a, always an investigation. So that is the disadvantage of the thing. And that's why the URS came now. Then with a smaller and smaller urethroscope, you can actually crush the stone and uh, do it for forever. So that is the new thing. It wasn't there. When there was a thin urethroscope not for there, and there was no question of expelling the stone by by crushing the stone so that one Dr. Harpin has said uh, if the electrolyte is not indicated laser you can use and uh, ultrasound the also sometimes can cause a vibration but you can always use it here so that is a so digestive is no problem but you can as it is positive infestation 
if you have got a choice, if you have got a chance, you can always. Um, now, good thing is we have silicon studs earlier which we are not having silicon studs. So silicon studs can be put and they can stay. You don't need to change it. Earlier we used to have this problem. And uh, since we don't have fluoro, we used to do it under the uh, under endoscopic. It's always a challenge sometime in obstructed stones. And uh, in fact, once you have done a PCN, you have decompressed the system. Uh, even DJ stand become uh, easier to keep because it's very difficult for a pregnant lady to manage a PC on a PCN. So if there is sepsis, if, it, if there is infection, you can start with it. Very easy to do it, and uh, and you can convert it to uh, uh, stent also. And you can go with the first first time also digestant if you can put it very easily. Because so if, if you don't forget the, that in the infected system, you're going to introduce the fluid, and with that fluid is also infected, you further increase the infection. So I have to be I have to customize and balance accordingly. Yes, sir. Yes. So if it's a non-emergency situation, as Dr. Hatsar said. Which is the time to intervene in a non-emergency? Emergency is a different. The pain has settled, still the stone in the ureter, and there's a hydronephrosis, no sepsis. So when you go in and intervene, first, second, third trimester, which trimester is the best? Second trimester. Sorry? Second trimester. Which one? Second, second trimester. Yes. So, one of the second trimester. Yes. Fine. Antibodies will go same. So, next is a complication. When uh, it's out for. Dr. Paul, you want to add something here? Sir, the only thing is. So many publications I have read, but everyone is not clear whether alpha blockers can be used endlessly for more than 10 months of three, four months or five months continuously. So we cannot say about and the progesterone itself, which dilates the small uterus of three centimeter to such a huge uterus. Similarly, ureters are also dilated. So every other, and then there is a more turnover of the uh, system. Uh, so whether alpha blockers are going to be of some use or not, we are not sure. So it should be used with minimal uh, utility. Secondly, antibiotics should not be used unless they are really necessary and for shorter duration. As soon as you feel that fever and chills has also started, TLC is rising then definitely PCN is a better altitude, better alternative to give drainage so that the intrapelvic pressure also reduces. So chances of septicemia are less. Then we have to see the duration, how much duration is remaining. At third or fourth month of a dry uterine in pregnancy, if you want to put a PCN, for next six months, she will have to carry the PCN. So then... Interrupt, then passing a ureteric uh, stent will be better. And uh, now silicone stents, they don't require a uh, multiple changes. Even if you have used a simple stent, sometimes it can last for six months or seven months. So no need to change again and again. These are all the, only the inputs I wanted to give regarding pregnancy. Coming to complications, Dr. Rahul, open up. You have covered it very nicely. Rahul, are you there? Harpreet, you are you are muted. Rahul was having one emergency in his hospital. I don't know. Rahul, are you there? I'll just call Sir Rahul. I think he must be there. Sir, you please share your thoughts about uh, uh, um, complications, uh, Paul, sir. No, he's, he has covered uh, excellently. Means all the uh, complications he has covered very nicely. So I don't have anything other than what he has said. But if they, there are any questions, doubts, or any clarifications, I would be happy to answer. But most of the people are not participating. I don't know. It should be an interactive discussion at this time. Absolutely. 
that's the reason we hurried down so that we have really no open house president president sir dr anvi sir wanted that we should have more time for discussion and we should allow residents to ask questions so we are open. i think uh, you have got a wonderful opportunity dr shivaji da is there dr paul is there and our president is also there and uh, so i'll ask sir, I, sir, I have i have one question sir and ask question please ask questions uh sir uh, sir mentioned uh, the risk factor risk factor of bleeding uh, during pcnl uh, sir mentioned uh, solitary kidney as a risk factor for bleeding uh, sir uh, uh, why solitary kidney is a risk factor for bleeding sir because solitary kidney has to function more it is a hyper functioning kidney probably the blood supply of the solitary kidney will be much more in comparison to the if there are two kidneys so there is a possibility that it may bleed more that is what i can think of and dr shivaji can tell us more no i i agree on that one uh, although although it was on a you know i mean uh, we meant a high risk thing we the bleeding and non bleeding complications so these are all high risk but uh, as dr pal said this a solitary kidney is a hypervascular so there is always a chance than the normal See, we see when there is a solitary kidney, we always see compensatory hypertrophy. Even the size is more. So once the size is more, there is a hypertrophy. Maybe some hyperplasia is also there. There are more glomeruli functioning, and there may be renal blood process, uh, pr pr perfusion will be more. As Dr. Rahul had said, 25% of the blood flow goes to the kidneys. So in this case, a solitary kidney is taking so much of blood flow. that may be the reason thank you sir the other complication i would like to um, uh, add at time sir you know, for rahul has talked about hydronemothorax there sometimes on the table if it's a hydronemothorax about a puncture there super poster to not be sure ultrasound give it can give anesthetic a clue about the um, hydronemothorax or so uh you should alter some so on the table before the removing the patient from the table what can get the infection if you are alter some sack so we can ask the candidates how intraoperatively they can suspect uh, hydro pneumothorax in a patient we are doing a pcnl tomorrow any of the candidates can tell us what are the things they can see and and suspect that this patient uh, is developing hydro pneumothorax and we need to intervene in this patient Who will take that question? Well, can I can only see by you. Why not? So, question is: You are doing a PCNL. It's a supracostal puncture. You cannot avoid that. And you have done the puncture. You have cleared the stone, and uh, you are putting an ephrosme. What are the things which uh, you will suspect? Which will give you a guide that uh, something is you have traversed the pleura or something is there. Something wrong is there. so how do you ensure that webhav did you understand what we said uh, yes sir you get the input uh, feedback from the anesthetist but uh, you can check some you have a, you have cm there you have ultrasound in the theater you have a stethoscope from the anesthetist something is monitors are running on what are the what are the things which will suspect you know baba this is not correct i should put a tube now only no abhi so if if you don't know you say i don't know then we will teach you doctor sai <laughs> if you say no i don't know we will teach you that is why we are uh, having a class no If you know something, you can tell us. If you don't know, then you say no. Then we move on. I, there is a now there is a one thing in between the I know or I don't know. It's the internet connection. Sorry about that. This is so uh, well, I, so I, I'll explain. So one thing is, it all depends whether you are doing under general anesthesia or you are doing under regional anesthesia. If you are doing under regional anesthesia and the patient is complaining of lot of pain. despite the everything so that means you are very close to the pleura or you have traversed the pleura second is if the patient becomes restless 
if, if the procedure has gone a bit long and the patient starts getting restless, then also he'll complain of a shoulder pain or he'll complain that he's not able to breathe properly. That should give the second hint. Third is anesthetic saturation. Look at always look at the saturation. If the saturation is falling or fluctuating, so that will also give you a hint. So how can you see it on table? If you are uh, you have a C arm there, you can through, take a picture of the lungs, see whether the margins are very clear or not. Or even if you have put a tube, if you are suspecting something, you can take a stetho and then you know you can auscultate the chest nicely and see what is happening. So if you have any area of doubt, you can do an ultrasound then and there and see if there is a significant fluid there or not. So these are some of the things which will uh, tell us whether uh, you are uh, you have injured the things and the pneumothorax or hydrothorax you are suspecting. Palser can add if, uh, if I miss something. I would like to add that when the patient is under spinal or GA, if he starts complaining of pain in the shoulder on that side, because if you are going transpleural, you have to go transdiaphragmatic also. You have to puncture the diaphragm and go into the kidney. And diaphragm innervation is through C3 and C4. That cannot be blocked by spinal anesthesia. So if the patient starts complaining of pain in the shoulder, you should be suspicious that you have gone transpleural, transdiaphragmatic. Tachypnea, breathlessness, shortness of breath. These are the symptoms which patient may tell. Clinically, you can see the falling saturation level. And then when the CM itself, as Rahul has pointed out, you can identify. Auscultation sometimes is not very clear because we are not urologists are not so used to. But if you have an ultrasound in the OT, that is a great help to identify there is pleural, some pleural fluid there. But unless there is a air in the pleural sac, there won't be a line. It will be just fluid or blood. Air can come either from outside or from inside if there is any uh, emphysematous chest or if there is any bully rupture or anything. From outside, if you have maintained a implant sheet through and through, it is only when you remove and stay for a while, air from outside can enter. Otherwise, in the plural sac, there won't be air. Air column will be only if you have left an aphrostomy or if you have stayed for some time, your implant sheet from skin up to the plural sac. And then it gets absorbed. So usually post-operative chest x-rays, you don't expect. We always expect there will be a level. And we will come to know, yes, there is a fluid inside. It will no, won't be there. The fluid, blood will be collected heavier here and there. So there will be radio opacity and collapsion, uh, collapse of the lung if there is a lot of fluid inside. So loss all these points, practical points should be taken into consideration. Loss of angle would be there and auscultation, I fully endorse uh, Palser's view that uh, we are urologists, we are not very keen. Secondly, when the puncture is there, the, there is a shortness of breath. Patient doesn't breathe very nicely on that side, vis-a-vis -vis on the opposite side. But you can always take the help of the anesthetist and CM, if you are suspecting something, do take a picture on the CM, negative karke. You can see whether there is a angle of the lung is maintained or the blunting has started to pair. Then that can, that will also give you some guide that you have you know injured that thing. Lastly, sometimes even in subcostal uh, punctures, there is a sympathetic effusion. So you have not gone transpleural, but most of the times, as one paper from Apple Goyal from Lucknow had shown, fifty-eight percent chest complications. If you do a CT of the uh, chest and abdomen next day, within within two days of the PCNL, 58% of the times, some pleural atelectasis, some fluid, some collection is noted. So it is not necessary that it is always a hemoneumothorax. So it may be just a sympathetic effusion which automatically settles in two to three days' time. Also, actually, Let us changing the position of prone to subine and then do it. And that's the time the anesthetist can manage them well. That's the time we doing the exit. Since uh, residents are not asking questions, so I'm going to ask questions now. <laughs> I have some slides, uh, question slides based on the presentation done by all the speakers. So I'm just sharing my screen. You can stop me wherever you all want. Uh, this is just to see 
uh, uh, people are sleeping or uh, awake. So I'm starting, uh, I'm sharing my screen and uh, I hope you know, you're not able to see the answer immediately. Yeah. So my first question is to Vaibhav. Which of the following condition is associated with an increased risk of nephrolithiasis? Underweight, metabolic syndrome, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, atopy. I have a first question to you. Metabolic syndrome, sir. Excellent. So, metabolic syndrome is characterized by obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and insulin resistance, and associated with an increased risk of kidney stone formation. None of the other conditions has been associated with stone disease. Next question is for Sonu. The best predictor for post percutaneous lithotomy uh, urosepsis is preoperative bladder urine culture. Interoperative bladder culture, stone culture, preoperative blood culture, interoperative blood culture. Uh, so stone culture. Great. So, best predictor is stone culture. Uh, uh, best predictor for post PNL urosepsis, stone culture, or renal pelvic urine culture uh, results are also important. So, that's why when you puncture, see, puncture that PCS, you have to see whether you are aspirating a turbid urine, clear urine. It's very important. And if, if there's a doubt, you can always send that puncture urine for the culture because you will not get that into the urine as the system is blocked. That part of the urine doesn't drain. Next question is to the Arif. Uh, what is the risk of mortality from an untreated steroid staghorn score? Less than 10%, 10 to 30%, 30 to 50%, 50 to 70%, greater than 70%. Arif, are you there? Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. What is the mortality for untreated steroid staghorn syndrome? Sir, I'm not sure, sir. Uh, Regarding the percentage. Just like other, 10 to 30 percent. Okay. So, 10, who spoke, who, who had told that? Sir, so no. Yeah. So, 10 to 10, 10, 10 to 30 percent, the 10 year mortality rates of untreated staghorn stone was 28 percent. Was a 7.2 percent in patient treated with surgery. So next question is to uh, Jed. What is the preferred treatment approach for a symptomatic 1.5 centimeter stone in a lower pole cholesterol diverticulum? Lower pole cholesterol diverticulum. I'm repeating it. SWL flexible rotoscopy, PNL, PNL with progression of the diverticulum and laparoscopic diverticulotomy. Yeah, it should not take this much time. I think before I finish question, you can answer this. Sir, so, on D, sir. Sir, okay. PNL with fulguration of diverticulum. Yes, so PNL yeah. with fulguration of diverticulum, percutaneous management of the patient with calcial diverticular stone provides the best uh, patient with the best chance of becoming stone and symptom free. And fulguration of the diverticulum uh, is now, I don't know, it's a lot of, lot of controversies going around. Maybe I'll ask Paul sir and uh, uh, Shivaji da to sum up at the end what is their uh, thoughts about this process. Because earlier we do used to fulgurate, but I don't see anything now. Uh, RIR is also coming, I don't see anybody fulgurating. So this is, I will ask the experts at the end. Next question is, what is the preferred treatment option for a patient with a symptomatic uh, 1.5 centimeter renal calculus and a coagulopathy? SWL, SWL after ad administration of fresh poison plasma, indwelling urethral scan, flexible urethroscopy, PNR. I am sorry, answer is still there. <laughs> there is no guesses for that. So we move to next question. I know the, all, all of you know this question. Answer. So the risk of urethral perforation is greatest with which of the following intracorporeal lithotripsy technology? Extra hydraulic, holmium laser, pulse dial laser, ultrasonic lithotripsy, elastic lithotripsy. Option A, electrohydraulic. Is right. Option A is correct. So that's why this this is the one lithotriptate which is contraindicated in pregnancy and even the ultrasonic ultrasonic because it makes loss of a lot of sound which can affect the fetal uh, hearing so that is also contraindicated what are the preferred initial power setting for hormone laser lithotripsy of urethral so this is uh, very irrelevant nowadays because people do a different setting this is just to make you sure what energy levels are safe for the ureters? No, 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 no. This a. is very relevant. Very relevant, sir. Please, Point. because they should know Point. what is option the a, sir. safe. Safe. Sir, option A, sir. 
which intercorporeal lithotripsy technology will most efficiently fra uh, fragment and evacuate renal calculi ultrasonic lithotripsy ballistic lithotripsy combination of ultrasonic ballistic lithotripsy polymium laser ehl sir see combination of ultrasonic and ballistic great great answer so this is is a com combination therapy is the best they do very well master lithoplast from ehs used to uh, um, uh, is still marketing there and also there is one from uh, shock wave pulse from the olympus why 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 it is there one who answered what is the advantage of this thing yeah what is the addition to this thing why why it is sir, better than sir, others said simon can you suck the small fragments yeah that is important so there is a suction mechanism with it so that is why it makes suction so alt ultrasound will if you don't have to co come very frequently inside so pneumatic your the pneumatic tip will break and ultrasound will make a small hole and it's completely suck up the thing so you can do the stagons very fast so it's a very very uh, yeah minimize the primary the calyx the the in the yashwa ji da please sir so i said uh, the rationally that you break it and then uh, ultrasound and that minimizes the trauma to the endothelium absolutely so the primary insert to the kidney exposed to shock waves occur in which of the following tissue blood vessel proximal tubules renal papilla glomerulus renal capsule who is taking this question primary sir option b sir okay is sir a blood vessel you will answer blood vessels because that is what we are worried about So reason of damage reveals rupture of nearby thin wall veins, wall of small arteries, glomerular and peritoneal capillaries, which correlates with the vasoconstriction measured in both treated and untreated people. This observation says that the microvasculation and the nephron are susceptible to shock wave damage. However, the primary injury appears to be a vascular insert. In so fact, what is uh, I think yeah. ESW is very less used. A, they, we have seen lot of lot of uh, damage to the kidney. uh by the eswl so we used to give a very very um uh, in in two to three settings not in, in not exceeding much power and not exceeding the shock to also used to give 1500 shocks and again come back and we used to see and do the doppler also in our time but now with the eswl and uh, other uh, rars and others have taken over uh, i like quick comment both from shivaji da and pal sir on this I, i i would like to ask them actually why is it how, what do you do To prevent this damage, how does it enhance the uh, efficacy of the ESW? What can you do? Anyone? That's what the ramping called the voltage ramping. You start from the small and go on increasing the voltage that sensitizes the microvascular damage, so you don't have the microvascular damage, and that increases the efficacy. That is called voltage ramping. so you have to start by 0.6 millivolt and then you can go to till the, to 1 millivolt and so you can you start to shock the kidney that as you get suddenly heat you go in a neurogenic shock similarly kidney also goes uh, the shock and where the constriction happen so it will start with a slowly slow slow, slow voltage and then you can go on increasing what is the most common secondarily infecting organism after percutaneous stone removal Rotus mirabilis, Klebsiella, Oxytocus, Pseudomonas, Aeruginosa, Staphylococcus, Epidermis, and Enterococcus faecali. So no, sir, Staphylococcus epidermis. Option D. Why? Let us skin comment sir. That D. Okay. Let us skin comment sir. 
So, suppose points are the most appropriately used antibodies for prophylaxis of surgical procedures in non-infected stone cases because the most common faculty infective organism is acepidermis because it is there in the skin. The so, risk factors for fallen injury during PNL include all of the following except. I think okay. if you listen to Rahul's presentation, he has beautifully made a table of this. Horseshoe kidney, kyphoscolysis, access lateral to posterior axillary line, previous jejunoiliar bypass for obesity, upper pole puncture. Upper pole puncture. I want to ask the boys on the slide, last slide. And antibiotics prophylaxis in PNL. What is their concern? And what are the current thoughts? Antibiotic prophylaxis. Go ahead, please. Uh, this is a very important thing we have not discussed, covered in our talk. Let's go. In a, in a uh, sterile urine culture, apparently sterile bladder urine culture, patient is going to have a PCNL. What is the, how do you, uh, what is the current concept of using the profile active Did you Weber? use that out? Weber, bolo, bhai. Sir, pre-operatively, we, we give a second uh, generation cephalosporin, sir, uh, ciftriaxon, sir. Intervenous for how many days? Yes, sir. Intervenous? Yes, sir. For how many days before the operation? There is a, Sir, uh, uh, I can't recent, uh, last example of urology has done an article on the uh, use of antibiotics in endo urology practice. Uh, Rishi Nair is the author of this article. Sir, if you, I will request all of them to go through that article. Sir, patient is symptomatic. It's one week to two weeks before uh, preoperative. No, no, no. Urine culture is dry. We are talking about prophylactic. During induction, or 48 hours before, which one is the current? You can give an the in, or induction or intravenous therapy. Sir, one? Sir, at the time of induction, sir. That's one. Other choice? Other <coughs> choice? Can okay. I take a question? 48 hours, sleeping process in therapy, but there is okay. no end okay. of that one. But intravenous, okay. during induction, there is no controversy on that one. The controversy of the what what did Dr. Paul say about it? Input. What way? Beso. What third? What kind of power gone? Don't leave us like that. Yeah, Dr. Paul. Yeah. Hello. Yes, ah, sir. There you uh, are. Current recommendation is only one dose of antibiotic, just uh, at the at the induction, and no more if the if the urine culture is sterile. Okay, See, right. all these all these recommendations are actually from the Western literature. Although, although uh, Rishi Nair has tried to sum up. But uh, I don't know whether we will agree to that, that the most common organism post-PCNL is uh, the Staphylococcus. Because it is the, because we are not, do, we are doing only urine culture and sometimes stone culture is different than what the urine culture is. Around match is only 53% of the cases. 47% there is no match. And the infection post-operatively will be predominantly because of what is bacteria growing in the stone, according to stone culture. And that is usually a urea splitting organism like Proteus, Clepsila and E. coli. So what in India we see mostly infection stones and most post-operative uh, sepsis by these three bacteria, not by strepto or staphylo. So, Rahul, what is your comment on that? I, I fully endorse your point, sir. Uh, it is high time that we do, uh, we have to have our own data. Staphylococcus is not the organism which I find. It is Proteus and Pseudomonas. Invariably exactly. in our setup, especially in which high volume centers, 
these are the two organisms which i find but equal i also there actually what rahul what what is the what is the aa is that we see more of a see urine culture a urine routine culture or whatever the organism is the gram negative so what we see is more of a gram negative in a clean contaminated case where your uh, culture is negative you see more of a e coli is still the dominant organism and of course a next follows by the proteus and pseudomonas is the proteus splitting organism so what palser is trying to make a point is that in a stewart stones or infector stones these are the proteus splitting organisms are more common so this is this is what actually uh, uh, comes from the camber where they they have a more of a skin infection and regarding see this study uh, i'm uh, of uh, and the comet uh, which has come in journal of uh, indian journal of virology what what is the common practice which we have found in everywhere most of the centers are doing is that they are keeping injectable antibiotics till we remove the catheter so it is not the first dose we are giving the first dose and we are forgetting the common practice is that when you are removing the catheter on first or second post of day your injectable antibiotics are uh, there and when patient is discharged they say no antibiotic but all of us are putting st stents and we have our hospital protocols so most of our end up giving 5 to 7 days of uh, antibiotics uh, appropriate antibiotics to the patient paul sir you have quick comment on this see aua recommendations are very strange they say only single dose of antibiotic at the time of induction if your urine culture is sterile no post operative antibiotics if the urine culture is unsterile 5 to 7 days of pre operative antibiotic aua guidelines are silent on the issue whether you should do a reculture and then only do pcnl when the patient is uh, having uh, sterile urine but in our case most of us we give 3 to 4 days of aminoglycosides because they cover most of these antibody most of these bacteria if the if the serum creatinine is normal and then go ahead with the uh, uh, pcnl actually we should do only when the urine culture becomes sterile only then we should do the procedure so aua guidelines may not apply appropriately in our setup i absolutely agree with you and especially they are absolutely silent on the reuse of the things which they cannot do it officially so we have to in our system i don't think we should be blindly following them it is better to have a institutional protocols because every place has different set of practice and different set of organisms but one point is for sure jo pal sir aapne bola ke in case of obstructed kidneys the proximal urine is invariably different from the voided urine sample you may have a sterile culture and still the patient may get fever and then you are surprised why that has happened it has happened because the proximal urine which was infected and you could not have any access to that you have disturbed that and the patient has got Sepsis. That's why intrapelvic urine is very important. Round the first I, urine I, which we were taking, if you remember, we were about at one point of time we were sending every patient uh, urine for the puncture urine, and used to have a uh, uh, culture positive despite being patient negative. As Paul sir mentioned, I, I think he was rightly mentioned, close to fifty to fifty-three percent patients have 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 positive culture. So. I think uh, uh, Paul sir, uh, 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 this, this discussion I came came to <laughs> conclusion that we can have one one study which we are planning on this antibiotic. We can uh, we can plan it and design it, and it is a very quick one to go. The amount of pcnl takes place the first uh, urine culture and what is the urine culture, so we can discuss it and I I think uh, we can do a multi centric thing and to find out it is our cost. from this discussion we can at least this one study is coming which we can take up and uh, do it sir can i have two minutes sir yes sir. i missed that point uh, at that time about metabolic evaluation uh, so uh, i just uh, ask uh, uh, secretary sir aapka message aa gaya hai so <laughs> kindly sandeep here is the last point <laughs> sir just uh, again we have metabolic evaluation sir uh, renal tubule acidosis acidosis is very important अभी तीन टाइप मेनली हैं टाइप वन टाइप टू एंड टाइप फोर टाइप थ्री अभी नॉर्मली अब यूज नहीं होता है टाइप वन इज आवर डिजिटल इन विच द यूरिनरी पी एच इज मोर देन फाइव पॉइंट फाइव टाइप टू इज प्रोक्सीमल वेर द यूरिनरी पी एच इज लेस देन फाइव पॉइंट फाइव इन बोथ वी आर है इन हाइपर कैल्सी यूरिया इज इन टाइप वन डिजिटल जिसमें नेफ्रोकैल्सिनोसिस होते हैं टाइप टू में नॉर्मली नेफ्रोकैल्सिनोसिस नहीं होते हैं 
टाइप टू में एक इम्पोर्टेंट सिंड्रोम है अपना फैनकोनी सिंड्रोम जो अपने को याद रखना चाहिए जिसमें अपना ग्लूकोज अमाइनो एसिड एंड पोटेशियम का काफी डिप्रेशन होता है हाइपोकेलीमिया होता है और इधर में अपना टाइप फोर में जो है वो हाइपो एल्डोस्टेरोनिज्म के लिए मेनली होता है उसमें अपने को पैराथॉर्मोन लेवल्स भी चेक करने होते हैं एंड टाइप फोर में अपना मेनली हो जाता है हाइपर कैलीमिया तो दैट हाइपर कैलीमिया हैज टू बी कंट्रोल्ड इन टाइप फोर ये ब्रीफली जस्ट अबाउट द रीनल ट्यूबुलर एसिडोसिस बाकी तो कैम्बल में पूरा एक चैप्टर ही है तो आई थॉट आई जस्ट मैंशन दिस फ्यू पॉइंट सो बेसिकली Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even the intracellular acidosis. Yes, sir. And associated hypercalcemia, you have to use at high right diuretics along with it. That's the bottom line of this. Yes. And and as a as what Dr. Paul was saying, the EUA guideline is the same. They think that uh, on induction antibiotics in this trial you don't get. But we all give at least even in the culture trial give a four 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 to five days of Antibiotics, and that at one stage, nationwide consensus was a use of propoxy for five days, and then to the PCML uh, in a negative culture. That has been taken off now. Uh, not everybody is using the propoxy. This is now uh, either aminoglycoside, which is a that on obstetric system, is easier, better to use that uh, aminoglycoside. What do you say on that one, Dr. Paul? In obstetric system, sterile. Going for a PCM. Arpit, yes, sir. Uh, I hand over to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, I hand so... over because tomorrow again we have a session. So I hand I hand over to uh, Ranjan Deshka. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, thank you. Shivaji Da. Thank you, Paul, sir. They are taking time out from a busy schedule. Uh, uh, I, I appreciated your commitment. I thank Rahul, Nitish, Sandeep uh, for uh, taking uh, making efforts to present and to all the residents who have joined today. So tomorrow we are beginning at ten. Rahul, you will be joining tomorrow. Great. So uh, I, I just we will have one one minute offline after this um, uh, session. We'll have one discussion in the WhatsApp group about who is how to we are going. To, uh, Ahead with everybody uh, to for tomorrow planning. Uh, Paul sir, will it possible tomorrow to for you to join for the question answer uh, uh, clinical session or uh, you have a yeah? Session? I'll be there up to twelve. After twelve, I'll go for rounds. Great sir, thanks. So, we'll, so we'll ten to twelve, I'll be there. Uh, we will look forward to your uh, expert comments on the clinical cases tomorrow. Uh, thank you. Over to Ranjan Des sir. Thank you very much, Arpit. You have made my job very easy. I once again thanking all my seniors, Dr. Basu, Dr. Pal, Sandeep, my uh, colleague, Dr. Sandeep, and at the, or at the top most, I must thank Dr. Harpit Singh, who has organized this uh, nice presentation for all the students, and the active cooperation and the participation from the students has made this class really lively. So tomorrow we are expecting all of you to be present by 10 o'clock so that we can conclude the most important part of our teaching that is uh, renal stone disease, I mean urinary stone disease. With that, I uh, say goodbye to all of you and hope Right, right. Welcome, tell your colleagues to join. Good night, good night, everybody. One uh, short.